Welcome back. In this video, we'll be focusing on how to scale and manage your business. You'll also be looking at how to gain exceptional levels of income in the long run continuously. Excellent businesses have an edge which allows them to get ahead of the race. This advantage is called timing. Timing is the ability to select the precise moment for doing something for optimum effect. In this case, timing is the ability to gauge how much time you or your team need to get certain things done. You'll come to a stage where your schedule has reached its maximum capacity and you'll need to balance your time between looking for new business versus having quality time with the people who matter to you. For example, if you have a new project which has a very set fixed deadline, how do you manage the allocation of work among your team? Do you simply delegate all of the work using a top-down method? Or do you take a really good look at the work required for the project and instead adjust the work needed and shave off things that don't need to be done? At this stage, you'll have gained some insights on how to generate new leads and manage existing clients. Instead of engaging in a one-man show, a better approach will be to set up a team to execute delivery while you focus on generating sales, marketing, and generating new leads pitching and networking. To do that, you need to be working on your business rather than in your business. Let's talk about how to project your income. Before you set up a team, you need to estimate your cash flow. Without having any idea of how much money your business can generate, it's almost impossible to accurately plan your business ahead and prepare for the tough times that may befall your outfit. Fortunately, predicting how much you can earn is not difficult. You can estimate how much your first year revenue is by calculating how much money you can potentially earn. If your company isn't generating as much as what you've estimated, take it as a sign for you to tweak your plans. When you're at the helm of your business, it's very important to remember that a healthy business has a healthy stream of income. Predicting how much we'll earn in the future is not easy, but there is a way by projecting your income. So how do we do it? First, list down your current average earnings of three months and multiply them by 12 months. The amount you get will be your estimated annual sales. Secondly, subtract the total cost of production of the year to get the gross profit of your company. Third, to get the company's net profit before taxes, Subtract the company's operating costs from the gross profit. The costs that will be incurred include employee salary, payroll, overhead cost, rather overhead cost, rental, etc. And after that, you'll need to further subtract the income tax from this. Taxes vary from country to country and from state to state. So I suggest that you should find the percentage of income taxes in your country to know your business net profit. Okay, let's talk about how to leverage and optimize your company. The next question you need to answer is how to increase revenue with the same amount of time and effort. You can do it by means of leveraging and optimizing your company. Leveraging your business means using your resources to their optimum advantage for improved results. One big question that you need to ask to leverage is this. Am I using all of my resources to their best advantage? Do I still have backseat roles in my team, which don't really contribute to anything? Do I really need these backseaters to complete projects or tasks? If you answered no or maybe, your business is ripe for leveraging on your existing talent pool and optimizing your team size so there are no backseats. Companies which can achieve more results with fewer resources are great examples of leveraging. One example is brand A which produces higher quality vehicles, even though brand B spends more on research. An African proverb says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, you need a team. Many businessmen struggle in their businesses because they try to do everything themselves. Some result in hating the entire process because they end up performing tasks which are not their field of expertise, such as production or operations. Some end up having to work extra hours unnecessarily. And the irony here is that they build a business 
with the purpose of having more free time and achieve financial freedom, yet they get swallowed up and chained to the business. What you need here is actually a team which can execute the more operational and technical aspects of the company. This way, you'll have so much more time working on your business, not in it, which includes strategic planning and direction. The SaaS strategy. As mentioned before, one of the perks of having a strong business is that you'll have more free time to focus on the management and directional aspects of your business. For this to happen, you'll have to start considering hiring a talented team of people to take care of the operational, daily, and day-to-day -day tasks. One of the best strategies you can deploy is the SAS, Simplify, Automate, and Systematize. Simplify. Keep things simple, organized, and straight to the point. Automate. Where tasks can be automated, automate them. Systematize. Build systems, processes, and standards by hiring managers that have knowledge of how to run the system. There are five main steps to simplify the business. First, write down in detail all the tasks you need to do on a daily basis. This includes everything from processing payments to product creation and meeting clients. Secondly, divide them into two categories, transactional and transformational actions. Transactional tasks are rudimentary and predictable, which include processing salaries, paying bills, rent, etc. Transactional tasks are perfect for automation. For example, sending out emails can be automated by using email services like MailChimp and Aweber. You just need some time to write all the emails, upload them onto the mail service, and set the time to send them. Transformational tasks, on the other hand, bring significant and positive impact to the business. They are the must-haves in the company. For example, business development, staff training, personal development, sales and marketing activities. These are more difficult to automate since different businesses will have very different needs. This also applies to the team behind it. The reason tasks are divided into these categories is so that we have clarity on what to prioritize and what to focus on, what positions to hire, the required job scope of those positions, and the salary that would match that job scope. Thirdly, analyze the list and eliminate redundant tasks, double entry tasks, and simplify the complex ones. To do this, you need to be disciplined and ruthless. The aim is to be efficient and fast. Find a way to automate tasks such as assembly lines or filing. Doing this opens up more time and energy for yourself and for your team to focus on more important tasks. Fourthly, lump the transactional tasks together outsource or hire an administrative staffer to take care of it so that you can focus on the transformational tasks. Lastly, hire and retain staff that can perform transformational tasks. The right kind of people can become an asset to your business. So don't be afraid to cut those who are not an asset to the business and not a good fit for the company. Retain the ones who work well together in the team. Again, make sure you minimize backseat roles as much as possible. Getting the right team. In the previous chapters, we've discussed about hiring a team to better handle the tasks that are needed to ensure your business thrives. The right team delivers the best results and will ensure the continuity of your business. But first, what is an ideal team size for your business? It's recommended to start with around five to seven people. A small initial team size is very important so that you can maintain team dynamics at the highest level. Dynamics require a solid context. So unless a solid context is set at the beginning, a team that is too small will only operate on orders and become very transactional and operational. You need to be there physically most of the time to manage such a team. And opinions that matter really won't be voiced by your small team. You don't want that to happen because you want your team to speak their thoughts, debate and challenge you in healthy ways. It's only through that process that you'll be able to spot and cover gaps in the business and ultimately do better. A yes person who says yes to everything, well, that kind of person is definitely a no-no on a team that's gonna grow. Keep a healthy balance between operational staff, creative staff and managers or supervisors in the team you hire. A good setup would be two managers or supervisors to every three staff. 
This is to keep the system running smoothly and maintain an optimal standards level. And again, keep in mind that you need to minimize the backseat roles in your business. So your staffers, they're not passive, but they're not managers either. Be clear on who you want and what positions you want to fill. You may do this from the list of tasks that you did earlier on. This will allow you more free time to start thinking on a higher level and work on your business, not in it. So do you want to hire a full-time staff or do you want to only pick up contractual staff that only serve for certain projects? The answer really depends on you, whether you want a full-time or contractual staff. Each has its own strengths and weaknesses, of course. A full-time staff has the highest chance of developing company loyalty and a sense of ownership to both their roles and the business. And the result is a committed workforce. But a part-time or contractual team can be an excellent staffing option too for smaller young businesses due to the potential for flexibility and the relatively low cost. Such workers necessarily work fewer hours and so they'll cost less in wages. You could even outsource certain rudimentary tasks to keep costs low. In terms of hiring, it's recommended to go with long-term contracts. You may also want to consider having a profit sharing scheme where the team can leverage off the business's success. This promotes empowerment, very strong staff loyalty, and lower staff turnover. This means less training time while saving you more time during the period of hiring and interviewing. Improving leadership, culture. If you happen to always end up with a poor performing team, let me tell you why. And it's a hard truth. The problem lies not with your employees, but with your lack of leadership skills. Sometimes your team can be excellent in performing their tasks, but there may be some aspects that you haven't really addressed or that have been overlooked that the performance does not reflect in the result. If you're facing this problem, there are three key points in managing and building an A team. The first one is creating culture. Culture is important as it sets the context and tone of the company. It governs mindsets, attitudes, and behaviors, which ultimately influence your sales and profits. If the company runs on a low energy level and your employees rarely converse with one another, what do you think the result would be? Well, definitely the result of the work becomes mediocre over time. To cultivate a high performance work culture, you need to set rules, often referred to as a code of honor. You can do this by gathering the team and listing down the desired attributes, attitudes, behaviors, and results that would require the team to practice excellence and achieve your company's goals. The code itself is a list of guidelines that helps the team perform well under an effective leadership. Examples of the code of honor items are playing 100%, never leaving a teammate behind, always expressing gratitude, or always learning to suggest a few. Filter out the unnecessary ones and then boil it down to a list of about eight to 10 rules. Put them into practice and uphold them to the highest level to set the team into high performance gear. An example of a rule that I personally live by, rule number one, commit to learning and personal development every day. On improving leadership, let's talk about learning and development. The second key point is to learn and develop. If the team is not learning and growing, then really they're dying. Therefore, your team needs to constantly sharpen their saw. There are always businesses out there who work harder, smarter, and quicker than your team. It's just a reality. And if there's no growth in learning or development, current or developing current talents, that is, surely one day, your competitors will close the gap and surpass you. This also means death to your business. If you're not learning, you're dying. Stay ahead of your competitors by structuring learning and development activities for your team. The reason is these activities help them to be very efficient and effective in problem solving, time management, and prioritization. There are lots of activities that you can do for your team to help their growth. The first is apprenticeship. This means sending your team over to other organizations to learn from them. This can be a very useful and effective way to eventually develop a new skill. Second is career counseling. This is where your team members discuss with their supervisor a career plan and develop that career plan to identify areas for improvement or advancement and how those areas can be addressed and also when. Coaching includes 
working one-on-one -on -one with the learner to conduct a needs assessment, set major goals to accomplish, develop an action plan, and support the learner to accomplish that plan. The team member drives these activities and the coach provides continuing feedback and support. Continuing professional development is very beneficial so that your team stays up to date in the views and practices necessary to lead and manage in today's organizations. There are an increasing number of universities, colleges, and training centers associating continuing education credits or continuing education units with their courses and workshops. So why not leverage those? Sometimes your team doesn't have the proper technique to learn and retain new things. Organizations and other environments are changing rapidly. Therefore, it's extremely important to continually be aware of those changes and to be reflecting on them and learning from them as well. Basically, with continuous learning, you help your team to learn and how to learn. Courses and seminars are great platforms for the learning and development of new knowledge or skills on your team. Courses with hands-on experience are even better since it'll help your team apply what they have just learned, making the lessons even more effective. Another great way to encourage self-learning for your team is to provide them with opportunities to give presentations. For example, have a 15-minute presentation on a topic that adds value to your team and specifically what you're working on. Let's say there are seven people on your team. That would be a total of 105 minutes of presentation every time you do this meeting. And if you do it every month, then annually, it would add up to 84 topics and 21 hours of learning. Okay, we've talked a lot about improving leadership. Let's do a quick debrief. The third key point is for you to do a debrief or a post-mortem after each successfully completed project. Debriefing is the most powerful learning tool to recap everything that you've learned. Debriefing is done by evaluating a recent project. Key areas to look into are reflections of what has been done, insights with the aim of that project towards the future, linking the challenge with the actions and how similar projects can be done more effectively in the future. Debriefs are important after your projects to identify gaps and insights as preparation for future projects. So in this stage, it's essential that your project team prepare a list of gaps during the project. There are two ways that you can go about this. The first is to identify the current gap that the project team detected and how to close that gap in the future. The second is to identify potential gaps in the future. An example is if you hear that your competitor is introducing a faster product sometime in the future, you might conclude that this could be significant to your business. Next part is to arrange a meeting session with your team. Now this is critical because your project team may have things that they might want to point out, which are actually critical, but not noticed during the project. Imagine skipping out on such a debriefing session and starting right away on the next project. Not only would it cause the same mistake to be made over and over again without anyone realizing, but your project team may be demoralized and further risking the projects in the future because of low morale. Therefore, it's your core role in these meetings to be a facilitator and to lead by conducting the session without bias, regardless of any employee's rank and regardless of what they say. The following questions are designed to facilitate insights from your team. What happened? What should have happened instead? What did we learn? How can we improve? What are the action plans for this session? At the end of the session, you'd have an action plan that the team can execute to improve on any aspects where there's a gap. All right, some people avoid this, but it's very important. Let's talk about managing your finances. The final part of this module is to manage your finances. If you don't know how to manage them, then I recommend that you hire or outsource this to someone else. But as a business owner in charge of your team, you need to know what your finances are to evaluate your business growth. The strategy is to minimize expenses by maximizing profits through sales and marketing. To do this, you need someone to monitor your company's cash flow. Unnecessary expenses are identified from the task list we created at the beginning of this module. When you eliminate those unnecessary tasks, you cut down your expenses. Upon receiving revenue, pay your staff first and yourself last. 
This is to take care of the engine of your business, the staff, and keep it running. It will definitely be a huge payoff in the long run, trust me. Then pay for what's necessary to keep operations running, like office, rent, utility bills, internet, uh, necessary equipment, etc. With the balance as net profit, allocate 10% to the growth and development of the team. This covers costs you'll need when sending qualified team members to seminars, workshops, investing in books and training videos. Do this strategically with a specific outcome in mind. Don't spend willy-nilly. Allocate another 5% to spend on R&R. The team simply can't be running 24-7, especially when it comes to creative work. The mind needs to rest and unwind, and funds are needed to accomplish that. There are business owners and team leaders who don't allocate any playtime for the team to recharge, and that always results in burnout and boredom. Without naming names, I can tell you that there are Fortune 500 companies that deal with internet commerce, and go ahead and Google the names of the top companies in the industry. You'll see examples of this. But when fund allocation is done in percentage versus value, the team is empowered, feels the sense of ownership for their work, and can contribute more actively in the company. All that needs to be done now is to increase productivity and marketing of the company. More revenue equals more profit. More profit equals more funds for learning, profit sharing, and R&R. &R. When your business growth expands, hire a sales and marketing team to bring in sales for the company. Do high tickets to attract more profitable business projects instead of small projects with less profit. An example of a high ticket would be a three to four day coaching program to help your clients expand their businesses using your sales and marketing knowledge. Allocate 10% of your net profit into researching new business opportunities in the market, studying about the future market trend and expanding your current business. And allocate another 20% into building a new company using the same kind of strategies and tactics. Doing this will potentially double, triple, or even quadruple your income. I know it sounds incredible, but it's true. In summary, these tactics have worked for me and have allowed me to build a seven-figure business. These tactics and moves are from my experience. Your goal is to replicate this success by copying and pasting it into your business. You don't have to think. Again, don't reinvent the wheel. Just copy my business. The quickest way to achieve success is to model off of someone who's already there.